dear Professor Thomas Lemke, colleagues, students, and guests. Um, as you know, the Center for Ethics and Law in Biomedicine, CILAB, has organized many conferences, workshops, and public lectures that focused uh, on the ethical, legal, and social challenges on new scientific advances in the field of biomedicine. Distinguished speakers, such as uh, John Harris, Ines de Beaufort, Donna Dickinson, Nicholas Rose, spoke on various challenges on contemporary biomedicine last year. Challenges that come from human desire and demand for enhancement, for longevity, and also for commercialization and commodification of the human body are the core of ethical debates that engage a large range of discipline inside and outside of life sciences. Our closest discipline of the medical law is a field in which boundaries are constantly reshaped and challenges, and it's a legal field in which established legal categories are suddenly seen as problematic. Today we will discuss uh, biocapital and bioeconomy that is increasingly developing and recognized more and more by several social scientists. To me, Issues such as biobanks, stem cell industry, biotechnological patents came to my mind when I first heard about the topic. Jane Bennett, in her work on vibrant matter, a political ecology of things challenges the life matter binary, she cites Latour when she emphasizes that modern cells feel increasingly entangled cosmically, biotechnologically, medically, virally, pharmacologically with non-human nature. But in any case, nature has always mixed up with self and society. Two topics which I am sure that uh, many of us have already uh, touched in, in uh, various projects here. Uh, one is the stem cell issue, which is very much connected to the subject when somatic cell nuclear transfer appeared late 1990s. It already reinforced concern among feminists about the emergence of new biotech industry that will rely on large quantities of human oocytes and bring about a problematic commodification on women's gametes and the body. The other thing which I think that uh, an important and relevant subject here is the issues of biobanks and it's also very interesting that uh, it's a peculiar fact that in the history of medical sciences the word bank has already appeared a long time ago in the context of blood banks. Nevertheless, the expression of biobanks continues to elicit critical comments, um, invariably seizing a commercial connotations of the word bank. Still, now it is used, I think, generally in several fields of genomic research. Looking at just the recent literature on this subject, we see striking complexity Triple Helix by Henry Atzkovist, a recent work on governing biobanks by Jane Kane, Susan McGibbon, and other works also highlight bioeconomies of genetic tests and biobanks. According to um, Catherine Waldy and Mitchell's concept on biocapital that refers to capacities of certain things such as organs and tissues that produce surplus values. One of the basic processes of biomedicalization, according to Clark, involves changes in political economy of health, illness, disease, and medicine per se. And another um, piece uh, of literature which uh, we frequently uh, cite in our even course reader, Sander Rajan, who defines biocapital not only as a system of exchange and circulation involved in the contemporary workings of life sciences, but also a regime of knowledge pertaining to the life sciences. But uh, we also learned a lot from the seminal work of Professor Thomas Lemke on biopolitics, an advanced introduction. And this work helped us to better understand Foucault's legacy, also the history of biopolitics even before Foucault. And of course, what was the novelty in Foucault's approach of and um, its uh, special uh, contribution to relational and historical attitudes to biopolitics. For us lawyers, scholars, uh, and social scientists and humanities, we would raise questions such as should we keep or modify existing legal binaries between things and persons, patents, non-patentable items, human, non-human cells? Should we make more nuanced legal distinctions in this field? Should we think about a kind of parapatent uh, system? 
which would better reflect this interconnectedness between a matter and life, how the shift from life to vibrant matter went through. The topic of Sala public lecture series pose so far unsettled questions in the intersection of gender, law, and bioethics, and we like this combination at the Center for Ethics and Law in Biomedicine. Today, uh, the lecture entitled uh, Biopolitics and Beyond, the Vibrant Matter and the Political Economy of Life, I'm sure it will be also a very important contribution to our ongoing debate. Professor Lemke will present and critically evaluate two promising areas of research emerge that have so far received little attention in work of biopolitics, the so-called new materialism, which shifts the accent from life to vibrant matter, and um, work on biocapital that investigate the systematic relation between neoliberal capitalism on the one hand and the emergence of biotech industry with new products mm -hmm. and series and services based on biotechnological knowledge on the other. Thomas Lenke is a professor of sociology with a focus on biotechnologies, nature, and society at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the Goethe University, Frankfurt. His research interests include social and political theory, biopolitics, social studies of genetic and reproductive technologies. Recent publication involves uh, Der Medizinische Blick in der Zukunft, also um, the governmentality, current issues, and future challenges um, published in New York, and uh, advanced introduction to biopolitics. We are very privileged to have Professor Thomas Lemke here at CU and at CELAB, and we are very much looking forward to his presentation with great interest, and I'm sure that uh, from the audience there will be a lot of questions and contribution to this very important debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith, for, uh, for the introduction and also for inviting me here to give a talk. I'm very honored by this invitation and um, I look forward to the discussions of how, how to link a vibrant matter political economy and the notion of biopolitics. Um, I'm afraid I have to lower your expectations, especially in the light of uh, what you just said. It's, uh, it's going to be more of a classic uh, talk, a classic lecture. Uh, it will be pretty long. There will be a lot of material, and probably too much material to digest, but I hope that you will get an overview of this, um, what I take to be an emergent field of, uh, of a complex uh, research and um, uh, of very interesting and pressing questions that relate to the, to the topic of biopolitics. Um, my starting point, the starting point of the talk will be the relational and historical notion of biopolitics uh, that was first developed by the French philosopher and historian Michel Foucault in the 1970s. In contrast to former conception of biopolitics, Foucault, as you will probably know, describes biopolitics as explicitly breaking with the attempt to trace political processes and structures back to biological determinants. Rather, he analyzes the historical process by which life emerges as the object of political strategies. From this perspective, biopolitics denotes a specific form of modern uh, power. So this would be the, uh, the break with the naturalist tradition of biopolitics. But Foucault's concept of biopolitics also maintains a critical distance to theories that view life as the object of politics, what I called uh, in my book uh, on biopolitics the politicist tradition. Foucault's, according to Foucault, biopolitics does, does not supplement traditional political competencies and structures through new, new domains and questions. It does not produce an extension of politics, but rather transforms its core in that it reformulates concepts of political sovereignty and subjugates them to new forms of political knowledge. Biopolitics in Foucault's work signals a break in the order of politics, and now comes the famous quote, 
the entry of phenomena peculiar to the life of the human species into the order of knowledge and power into the sphere of political techniques, end of quote. Foucault's concept of biopolitics was, after his death in 1984, received in many different ways. In my short introductory book on biopolitics, I propose to distinguish between two main central, two main lines of reception. The first has its home in philosophy and social and political theory. It focuses on the meaning of politics. How does biopolitics function and what counterforces does it mobilize? How does it separate itself historically and analytically from other political forms? The extreme poles of this debate represent the most prominent contributions. The writing of Giorgio Agamben on the one side and those of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri on the other. The second line of reception has its starting point in the sociology of science and technology, the history of science and medicine and cultural anthropology, together with feminist theory and gender studies. Its main interest is in the meta of life. If, as a result of biotechnological developments, the living body is now understood as a readable and rewritable text, then the question of biopolitics is posed in a new way. What is life within such a political technical const constellation? However, I don't want to go into the different line of, lines of reception and the reformulations and revisions they propose regarding the concept of biopolitics. Rather, my talk explores promising areas of research that so far have received little attention in work on biopolitics. I will focus especially on two of them, the so-called new materialism, which shifts the accent from life to vibrant matter, in the, in the words of uh, Jane Bennett, uh, vibrant matter, and the work on biocapital that investigates the systematic relations between neoliberal capitalism on the one hand and changing concepts of life and the emergence of a biotech industry on the other. As I will argue, both of these extensions of Foucault's analysis open up new directions in the analysis of biopolitic, biopolitics by inquiring into the mode of politics and the matter of life. Both go beyond Foucault's original formulation of biopolitics, which was uh, centered around the, around the poles of the population and the individual, and its humanistic and anthropocentric limitations. And they seek to address a different topography of power. While new materialism questions the concept of life that takes for granted the distinction between organic and anorganic, matter and life, theories of, theorists of biocapital shift the analytical interest from the state, population policies, and national governance to economic processes and capitalist strategies that take as their object the preservation or enhancement of vitality and well-being. After briefly presenting the two areas of research, I will explore the perspectives of Foucault's work vis-a-vis -vis the two challenges. I will argue for a closer realignment of biopolitics and government as a way of addressing the two challenges and overcoming the limitations of Foucault's work. I will then propose an alternative concept of government that Foucault only briefly discusses in his lectures on governmentality at the Collège de France of 1978 and 1979. The idea that to govern means to govern things. However, what I will present here is not even work in progress. At this point, I'm only beginning to think about this topic, and what I will present today is more a series of programmatic reflections than a substantial account. Mm -hmm. Having said this, let us start with the first challenge, from biopolitics to biocapital. Biotechnological innovations and biomedical developments have often generated high expectations and hopes. They have been associated with the idea that new markets, services, products, and industrial sectors would emerge to profoundly change and revolutionize societies and e economies. This vision has been taken up 
in ambitious political action plans by the UECD and the EU and in national initiatives, in, and in, in national initiatives postulating that the boundaries and the substance of the economic have to be redefined. The economy, according to this proje projection, will soon transform itself into a bioeconomy. In 2006, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development published the bioeconomy to 2030, designing a policy agenda. Bioeconomy is defined in this programmatic text as a society's sum total of economic operations which use the potential value of biological products and processes in order to create new growth and prosperity for citizens and nations. At approximately the same time as the UECD document appeared, the human the European Commission adopted a plan with a similar goal. The Commission stressed that the potential of a knowledge-based bioeconomy that would sim simultaneously strengthen European competitiveness in international markets, help to protect the environment, and develop more sustainable forms of energy, food, and biologically renewable materials. Both the European Commission's and the OECD program, and also national initiatives like the creation of the Bioeconomy Council in Germany to recommend strategies and action plans for a sustainable bioeconomy, are meant to promote new products and services derived from bioscientific innovations. Central to this vision, therefore, is the creation and regulation of markets rather than a fundamental realignment of the economy as the term bioeconomy tends to suggest. This enlarged meaning of the word appears in scientific works which in contrast to the political programs observe a decisive and structural transformation of economic relations. In the past decades, scholars have proposed a variety of new terms and concepts to critically evaluate the articulation of biotechnological innovations and transformations in economic structures and contemporary capitalist regimes. These propositions include genetic capital, organic capitalism, biowealth, bioinformational capitalism, <coughs> biotech mode of reproduction, biovalue, biocapital, and life as surplus. Here's just a um, just some, um, some examples of this uh, kind of literature that appeared in the past 10 years. The concepts often differ, and they all merit an extensive discussion, something that is beyond the scope, of, the scope of this talk. Here, I will just have the time to focus on one of the most influential accounts, conceptualizing the link between capitalism and the life sciences the concept of biocapital in the work of Kaushik Sundarayan. Kaushik Sundarayan's book, Biocapital, the Constitution of Postgenomic Life, was published in 2006. While Sundarayan did not coin the term biocapital, his book has done much to popularize the concept by providing an insightful account of the relationship between bioscientific innovations and transformation in contemporary capitalism. From a theoretical standpoint, Sundarayan links Foucault's concept of biopolitics to Marx's critique of political economy, situating both within his anthropological analysis. His empirical thesis is that the emergence of the biosciences marked a new form and a new phase of capitalism. He argues that the constitution of biocapital can be mapped through a dual perspective. I quote, on the one hand, what forms of alienation, exploitation, and divestiture are necessary for a culture of biotechnology innovation to take root? On the other hand, how are individual and collective subjectivities and citizenships both shaped and conscripted by these technologies that concern life itself? End of quote. Sundarayan's book is based on a multiplicity of field studies, observations, and interviews with scientists, physicians, entrepreneurs, and government representatives in the United States and India. 
It combines detailed ethnographic research with comprehensive theoretical reflection. Although the book's subject matter is broad, the empirical focus of its analysis is centered on the development of pharmaceuticals, especially the question of how genomic research has transformed their production. An important aspect of contemporary pharmaceutical research aims to create personalized medicine. That is to say medicine whose production is based on the genetic traits of the patient. Sundarayan argues that the scientific production of knowledge can no longer be separated from the capitalist production of value. Two risk discourses permeate each other in this area of pharmaceutical research. The medical risks that current and future patients have of suffering from a major illness and the financial risk of pharmaceutical companies whose great investment in research and development should ultimately result in commodities. Sundarayan describes this branch of industry as a special form of capitalism, a speculative capitalism that is based less on the manufacture of concrete products than on hopes and expectations and which brings together into an organic synthesis the hope of patients that new medical treatments will be developed and the zeal of risk capitalism for future profits. An important aspect of the book and its analysis of biocapital is the accent it puts on the speculative dimension of biocapital. Sundarayan stresses the importance of visions, hype, and promises. From this starting point, he is able to make the argument that the circulation of capital cannot be separated from expectations and hope, and also the production, and also the production of economic value is tied to moral values and ethical questions. Sundarayan's work on biocapital is part of a more general theoretical reconsideration. In a very influential and insightful article, Stefan Helmreich has identified two particular clusters of theories, or as he calls a species of biocapital. First, a Marxist feminist cluster, including the work of social scientists like Margaret Locke and Sarah Franklin, which is concerned with production and reproduction, and focuses on the analysis of biological matter. Second, a Weberian Marxist cluster paying closer attention to questions of meaning and concerned with how, I quote Helmreich, relations of production are described alongside accountings of ethical subjectivity, end of quote. In addition to Sundarayan's work, the second cluster contains contributions by Eugene Thacker, Linda Cooper, and many others. Helmreich rightly notes that all species of biocapital present a specific fusion of Marx's political economy and Foucault's concept of biopolitics, and that there are often overlaps between the two clusters of theories. However, the exact relation between Marx and Foucault, biocapital and biopolitics, is often unclear. While some theorists of biocapital seem to subscribe to the idea of a new phase of capitalism, engendered by the emergence of a biotech industry and new biotechnological innovations, others, like Nicholas Rose, distance themselves from Marxist theory to diagnose a straightforward shift from biopolitics to bioeconomics. Quote Nicholas Rose, Biopolitics becomes bioeconomics, driven by the search for what Catherine Waltby has termed biovalue, the production of a surplus out of vitality itself. End of quote. In a critical review of the literature on bioeconomy, biovalue, and biocapital, Keen Birch and David Tinefield have identified several inconsistencies and ambiguities in this area of research. They stress several critical points. First, there is an issue with how to link vitality and value, especially in the concept of bio-value. The concept seems to be based on the idea of an already present and even abundant vitality that pertains to the biological material, an idea that conflicts or even contradicts the insight 
that health and well-being are at least in part socially mediated or constructed. They hold that biological matter cannot be the source of value in itself, in itself, rather it is the knowledge that allows to transform cells, tissue, genes, and so on, into commodities that is valuable. Second, Birch and Tyfield criticized that the distinction between economic value and ethical values tend to collapse in many works on biocapital or the bio bioeconomy. According to them, theorists of biocapital tend to downplay the importance of political economic processes by overemphasizing ethical values and subjectivities. And finally, Birch and Tyfield diagnose that Marxist concepts like surplus, capital, capital, value, are only selectively adopted without adequately addressing their original formulation in Marxism, especially in the labor theory of value. In addition to the points Birch and Tyfield raise, one might critically in inquire into the danger of fetishizing the general notion of bio. It is necessary to investigate the analytical and critical value of notions like biovalue, biocapital, etc. Otherwise, critical analysis runs the risk of either essentializing biological processes, life itself, as something original and vital that is captured and exploited by capitalism, or taking at face value the rhetoric of the bioeconomy as, as a new era of production and industry. However, despite all the critical points one might want to raise concerning theoretical ambiguities or inconsistencies, the fact remains that we can give credit to work on the political economy of life for going beyond the traditional focus on political institutions and actors to address economic structures and processes. It also goes beyond the traditional Foucauldian poles of individuals and populations to take into account the non-human uh, or life forms beyond the human, cells, embryos, organs, tissue, and so on. At this point, the interest in bioeconomy or biocapital links up with the debate about the new materialism, to which I will now turn. While theories of biocapital include living matter beyond human being in their analysis, the new materialists often define matter as living. Let us now move to the second challenge of the concept of biopolitics from biopower to think power. Recently, social and political theory has demonstrated a renewed theoretical interest in matter and materiality. The new materialism, as it is sometimes called, does not represent a homogeneous style of thought or a single theoretical position, but encompasses a plurality of different approaches and disciplinary perspectives, ranging from science and technology studies via feminist theory and political philosophy to geography. The new materialist scholarship shares the conviction that the linguistic term or primarily textual accounts are insufficient for an adequate understanding of the complexity and the dynamic interplay of meaning and matter. New materialists often stress that the focus on discourse, language, culture, not only leads to impoverished theoretical accounts and conceptual flaws, but also re results in serious political problems and ethical quandaries as it fails to address central challenges facing contemporary societies, especially economic change and the environmental crisis. The new materialism is the result of a double historical and theoretical conjuncture. The 1970s and 1980s were marked by the decline of once popular materialist accounts, especially Marxism, and the rise of post-structural and cultural theory, theories. 
while the later rendered problematic any direct reference to matter as naively representational or naturalistic, new materialists are convinced that the epistemological, ontological, and political status of materiality has to be reconsidered, and a novel camp and a novel concept of matter is needed. In contrast to older forms of materialism, the call for new materialism refers to, to the idea that matter itself is to be conceived as active, forceful, and plural, rather than passive, inactive, and unitarian. The material term criticized the idea of the natural world and technological artifacts as mere resources or raw material for technological progress, economic production, or social construction. It aims at a new understanding of ontology, epistemolo epistemology, ethics, and politics to be achieved by overcoming anthropocentrism and humanism. The split between nature and culture, linguistic or discursive idealism, social constructivism, positivism, and naturalism. Central to this movement is the extension of the idea of agency and power to non-human nature, thereby also calling into question conventional understandings of life. Again, I'd like to focus on one representative of this new materialism, Jane Bennett. Jane Bennett is professor of political theory at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. Her starting point in Vibrant Matter, a Political Ecology of Things, published in 2010, is the assumption that matter must be addressed as an active part of a political process that has so far been dominated by human subjectivity. The aim of the book is to rethink the traditional distinctions between matter and life, inorganic and organic, passive object and active subject. Instead, Bennett invites us to conceive of what she called vitality of matter, a concept that upsets the conventional conviction that agency is an exclusive property of human beings. I quote uh, Bennett, by vitality I mean the capacity of things, edibles, commodities, storms, metals, not only to impede or block the will and designs of humans, but also to act as quasi-agents or forces with trajectories, propensities, and, or tendencies of their own." End of quote. Seen in this light, agency is no longer an exclusive property of human beings. Rather, the force of non-human actors in events needs to be acknowledged. Bennett employs and synthesizes a heterogeneous bunch of theoretical concepts and ideas from Lucretius, Spinoza, Adorno, Latour, Thoreau, Bergson, Dewey, Deleuze, and Guattari to arrive at a different concept of agency. There are two aspects of this concept of agency. First, she argues that agency needs to be distributed across a wider range of ontological types, as she calls it ontological types that cut across the human-non-human -human divide so that things like food and minerals can be reconceptualized as having the ability to produce effects. Second, she moves beyond the focus on individual bodies and their borders to propose a concept of action that is conceived of as the effect of certain configurations of human and non-human forces she calls assemblages taking up uh, the notion by Deleuze. Bennett coins the, coins the term think power to account for the ability of inanimate things to produce effects by operating in conjunction with other material bodies. However, one might diagnose a certain ambiguity in Bennett's work in claiming that, a quote again from Bennett, everything is in a sense alive end of quote. She implies that even inanimate matter possesses central constituents of vitality. This position is only partly convincing. While it is certainly right to conceive of life not as a property that pertains to specific bodies, but as a process or rather the outcome of certain materialities, 
it might be more accurate to distinguish between differently composed materialities and various complexities of conjunctions between bodies, in which the distinction between animate and inanimate bodies may play a crucial role. As Bruce Brown and Susan Watmore put it, I quote, is more gained from a closer attention to the specificity of the matter at hand as opposed to a generic analogy to life that could be described as metaphysics, end of quote. In fact, it might prove more fruitful to explore the material and technical conditions that produce life dependent on and operating in conjunction with other bodies than the idea of an all-encompassing vitality of matter and an original force of things. Where does this leave us with respect to the Foucauldian concept of biopolitics? How do the two challenges affect this? My proposal is that we consider resituating the concept of biopolitics within an analytics of government as a way of overcoming some of the limitations of Foucault's original work and addressing the critical points raised by the work on biocapital and in the new materialism. I will try to show that such a theoretical perspective is informed by elements in Foucault's work, but it was never systematically developed there. This necessitates going beyond the original framing of biopolitics in Foucault and aims to provide a systematic linkage and theoretical reconsideration of the concept of biopolitics and governmentality. In this theoretical perspective, biopolitics is understood as an art of government, taking up the phrase by, by Foucault. An art of government that takes account that takes into account the relational network of power processes, practices of knowledge, and forms of subjectivation. This suggestion is tied to the project that Foucault formulated when summarizing his 1979 lecture at the Collège de France on, that's the title of the lecture, The Birth of Biopolitics. I quote, uh, the theme was to, was to have been biopolitics, by which I meant the attempt starting from the 18th century to rationalize the problem posed to governmental practice by phenomena characteristic of a set of living beings forming a population, health, hygiene, birth rate, life expectancy, race. End of quote. There's a widespread view that in the framework of his analytics of government, Foucault did not concern himself further with the theme of biopolitics. I believe that this view is mistaken. The theme was not abandoned, but experienced a theoretical shift. Foucault places the question of biopolitics in a more general theoretical framework designed to allow a systematic linkage between processes of power, knowledge practices, and forms of subjectivation. Within this perspective, biopolitics has more to do with techniques of government and self-government going beyond practices aimed at corporal discipline and regulating the population. The birth of biopolitics is closely tied to the emergence of liberal forms of government. Foucault understands liberalism as a specific form of leading human beings which is oriented toward the population as a new political figure and disposing over the political economy as a technique of intervention. Liberalism introduces a rationality of government that differs from both medieval concepts of rule and early modern raison d'etat, the idea of a nature of society forming both the basis and boundaries of governmental action. The 18th century emergence of political economy and of the population cannot be separated from the beginnings of modern biology. Liberal concepts of autonomy and freedom are closely connected to biological concepts of self-preservation and self-regulation that came to prevail over the previously dominant 
physical mechanistic model for investigating the body. Originating around 1800, biology was based on an organizational principle, understanding the visible phenomena of life as emergent essentially at random, without a set plan. Internal organization thus replaced an external order corresponding to the plans of a higher authority beyond life. With life functioning as an abstract and dynamic principle equally inherent in all organisms. Categories such as self-preservation, reproduction and development now came to characterize living bodies placed at a greater distance from artificial creations than has been the case before. When in the lectures of 1978 and 1979, Foucault defines liberalism as the general framework of biopolitics, this signals a shift of accent from his previous work, resulting not least in a self-critical insight. By this time, Foucault thought his previous analysis of forms of biopolitical power had been one-sided and unsatisfactory, since they've focused mainly on processes involving population regulation and corporal discipline. Foucault's analytics of government forms a contrast to this, expanding corporal politics with the perspective of a vital politics. This concept stems from Alexander Rousteau, one of the most important representatives of post-war German liberalism whom Foucault briefly touches on in his 1979 lecture. By vital politics, Rousteau means a form of politics, I quote, that considers all factors upon which happiness, well-being, and satisfaction in reality depend, end of quote. This politics is, he indicates, by no means limited to action by the state, but, again a quote, is politics in the broadest possible sense, all social measures and experimental arrangements, end of quote. It relies on social ties and spiritual cohesion and reactivates moral values and cultural traditions. Vital politics denotes a task of integration and innovation needing to take in all societal elements and levels while simultaneously acknowledging their self-directing competencies. Foucault's analytics of government takes account of these bio, not bio, vital political ambitions of neoliberal governmental practice, tying the analysis of physical biological being to an examination of subjectivation processes and moral political forms of existence. To me, this idea of an art of government addresses biopolitics as a political economy of life enabling us to go beyond purely economic considerations to approach the interplay of moral values and economic value, concepts of life, vitality and health, and capitalist <coughs> production that characterize work being done on biocapital at the moment. But even if this work on biocapital could be articulated within an analytics of government, what about the new materialism? Isn't government essentially about what Foucault called the conduct of human conduct? Isn't Karen Barat one of the most important figures of the new materialism right when she argues that Foucault's concept of biopower does not provide a dynamic concept of materiality that takes account of the materialization of human as well as non-human bodies? However, a more fruitful reading is also possible. At least this is what I suggest. In the 1978 lecture series at the Collège de France, Foucault refers to what he called a curious definition of government, provided by Guillaume de la Perrière in an early modern tract on the art of government. <coughs> Here, government is conceived of as the right disposition of things arranged so as to lead to a suitable end, end of quote. Foucault quotes de la Perrière. 
Foucault stresses that the reference to things is decisive in this definition, which distinguishes government from sovereignty. While the former operates with and on things, the latter is exercised on a territory and, quote Foucault, consequently on the subject that inhabit it, end of quote. According to Foucault, de la Perrière's government of things does not constitute an additional domain of government apart from and separate to the government of man. Rather than restaging an opposition of things and man, it relies on, quote, a sort of complex of man and things, end of quote. It's worth quoting the whole passage. The things government must be concerned about La Perriere says, are men in their relationships, bonds, and complex involvements with things like wealth, resources, means of subsistence, and of course, the territory with its borders, qualities, climate, dryness, fertility, and so on. Things are men in their relationships with things like customs, habits, ways of acting and thinking. Finally, they are men in their relationships with things like accident, misfortunes, famine, epidemics, and death, end of quote. There are several points important to be noted here. First, following Foucault's interpretation, the art of government does not conceive of interactions between two stable and fixed entities, humans and things. Foucault employs a relational approach. This is why things appear in inverted commas. In fact, the qualification human or thing and the political and moral distinction between them is itself an instrument <coughs> and effect of the art of government and does not constitute its original point of departure. Thus, the government of things does not rely on the foundational sorting of subjects and objects. Quite on the contrary, Foucault questions the idea that contrasts active subjects with passive objects. In this perspective, the art of government determines what is defined as subject and object, as human and non-human. It establishes and enacts the boundaries between socially relevant and politically accepted existence and pure matter, something that does not possess legal moral protection and is reduced to things. In distinguishing between government on the one hand and sovereignty and discipline on the other, in the lecture of the 11th January 1978, Foucault introduces the notion of the milieu. The milieu he says, is, I quote Foucault, a set of natural givens, rivers, marshes, hills, and a set of artificial givens, an agglomeration of individuals, of houses, etc. end of quote. It defines an, again a quote, intersection between a multiplicity of living individuals working and coexisting with each, with each other in a set of material elements that act on them and on which they act in turn, end of quote. Here Foucault quite clearly accepts the idea that non-human matter exercises agential power that affects humans. Also, the milieu articulates the link between the natural and the artificial without systematically distinguishing between them. Secondly, since there is no pre-given and fixed political borderline between humans and things, it is possible to state that humans are governed as things. While medieval forms of government sought to direct human souls to salvation, modern government treats human beings as things to achieve particular ends. By this, Foucault does not mean a global and all-pervasive process of reification, reducing man to passive and inert things. Quite on the contrary, the interests, sensations, and effects of man are essential facts that political reason, a rational knowledge that no longer relies 
the divine order of things or the principle of prudence and wisdom has to take into account. In his comprehensive history of the art of government, Michel Senelat underscores this, theoret this uh, historical transformation that distinguishes the modern concept of government from the principle of sovereignty. A quote from Senela, the government of things replaces the older government of, of the souls and the bodies. The question is no longer as it was with the Christian authors about the, the legitimate use of power, nor is it the one raised by Machiavelli of the exclusive appropriation of power. The question is now about the intensive use of the totality of forces available. So we note the passage from the right of power to a physics of power. While sovereignty focuses on the individual will and legal subjects, government works on empirical quantities, on geophysical phenomena, climate, water supply, geographical data, as well as biodemographical facts, birth and death rates, health status, lifespan, the production of wealth. By statistically aggregating men on the level of populations, they finally become calculable and measurable and could be conceived of as physical phenomena themselves, a social physics, in the words of the Belgian sociologist Adolphe Ketelé. The governor has to take into account the passions and interests of the multitude in the same way he has to take into account the climate and the territory. And he has to govern them according to their own nature. Given this physical perspective, it would be a mistake to make a systematic political distinction between humans and things. As Foucault put it, to govern means to govern things. The third point. In introducing the idea of a government of things, Foucault stresses that it enacts a mode of power very different from sovereignty. I quote Foucault, it is not a matter of imposing a law on man, but of the disposition of things. That is to say, of employing tactics rather than laws, or of as far as possible employing laws as tactics arranging things so that this or that end may be achieved through a certain number of means, end of quote. According to Foucault, the art of government consists in the conduct of conduct, in structuring, as he put it, the possible field of actions of others. Two things are worth restating. First, government leads indirectly by arranging things or managing complexes of humans and things. And second, government works on a terrain that is created by the practices of government themselves. Let me conclude. Although Foucault never systematically addressed the question of how things affect humans, the conceptual shift to a government of things not only makes it possible to extend the territory of government and multiplies the elements and relations it consists of. It also initiates a reflexive perspective that takes into account the diverse ways in which the boundaries between the human and the non-human world are negotiated, enacted, and stabilized. Furthermore, this theoretical stance makes it possible to analyze the sharp distinction between the natural on the one hand and the social on the other, matter and meaning, as a distinctive instrument and effect of governmental technologies and rationalities, or as a specific form of what Anne-Marie Moll calls ontological politics. Let me be clear, Foucault's writings did not so much systematically pursue as offer promising suggestions for this analytical perspective. He never concretized his remarks on the relation between biopolitics and liberalism, though this was meant to stand at the center of the 1978 lecture. Nor did he ever actively pursue the idea of government liberated from its anthropocentric connotations. Filling out this program, developing it, 
and making it useful for contemporary theoretical debates and political struggles is the challenge facing current research on the concept of biopolitics. Thank you very much. Thank you.